welcome everyone to the, the 2021 Rethink Conference. Um, really excited to have everyone here and especially to, to meet uh, some of the, um, uh, the people behind the, all the essays that we've read. Um, so first things first, a warm welcome and thank you so much for taking your time to, to join us today. And um, thank you everyone who participated and also a big congratulations to anyone who made um, uh, the honorable mention finalists or, and just everyone who uh, participated in this, um, in this event. So I'm just gonna quickly go over the, uh, the conference agenda. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly do an introduction. Um, I'll briefly announce all the competition finalists and, um, uh, and then we'll move straight into student presentations. We'll begin with Sean Chua um, and then move through uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the five winners of the competition. Um, unfortunately, um, we're missing uh, uh, Madeline Chung today, who had to go to a dance recital, but um, uh, so her piece wouldn't won't be won't be shared today. Um, but um, a quick overview of the competition uh, this year. So uh, the twenty twenty one Rethink competition. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary international high school competition. Uh, we're judged by leading Cambridge academics, and we're sponsored by the Cambridge Center for International Research. Um, so we'll briefly, I'll, I'll briefly have the judges introduce themselves in a minute. Um, but um, I just want to briefly recap this year's theme. Uh, the theme this year was the stories of science and the significance of COVID-19. And we asked you guys to explore uh, the pandemic from a number of perspectives, from the perspective of creative nonfiction, from your own lived experiences, um, from the perspective of science and of public science and popular science, and, and also from the perspective of the social sciences and humanities, exploring the question of what COVID-19 means um, for humanity moving forward. And the aim of this competition was really to get everyone to reflect on your experiences, to give expression and form to your experiences, and also to start discussions about important issues that have ar arisen out of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, these include issues of science, of the significance of science, of education, and so on. So some quick statistics. We had over uh, 200 signups to the competition this year uh, from a total of 21 countries. Um, at the end of the day, we picked 16 finalists uh, with one uh, third prize, one second prize, and one first prize winner from each category. Um, so a quick word about uh, CCIR. So CCIR is a social enterprise who are registered in Cambridge, UK and founded by a group of Cambridge graduates. Um, our goal really is to um, uh, provide a number of programs and initiatives that connect uh, academic researchers and academia to the wider public. Um, the essay competition is one of our initiatives. Um, I'll speak a little bit more about what we do at the Academy when I mention uh, the prizes. Um, so uh, it's our honor and pleasure this year to have um, three uh, researchers join us as judges. Um, they are um, Dr. Tom McLeland from the philosophy department in Cambridge, Dr. Hande Guzel from the sociology department in Cambridge, and Dr. Danielle Cassis from the economics department in Cambridge. Um, so quickly, um, if you guys don't mind, uh, to just do a quick sort of uh, self-introduction for each of you guys. Um, Tom, would you like to go first? Sure, yes, I'm Tom Cleland. Um, as Oliver says, I'm a philosopher based in the Faculty of Philosophy. Um, I work on various topics in philosophy of mind mainly and ethics, and I draw heavily on um, research in psychology. Uh, and I'm also a director of studies at Selwyn College. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Hande? Um, yeah, hello, this is Hande Guzel, um, and I'm a sociologist at the University of Cambridge. I research and teach themes across gender, race and health, um, sexuality, body emotions added to that. And regionally, my primary focus is the Middle East. Uh, thanks, Hande. Uh, and uh, Daniel? Hi, uh, I'm Daniel Cassese. I'm a research fellow in economics at Emmanuel. And um, I do research on 
complex systems, social complex systems, meaning mathematical modeling of uh, how information spreads or how epidemic spreads and similar related topics. Yeah, so um, as you guys can see, we have really uh, quite a wide array of uh, perspectives, um, uh, a really sort of interdisciplinary panel of judges. And it'll be really interesting, I think, um, especially when we get to the presentations and the discussions that follow uh, to hear what the judges uh, and, and uh, have to say about the pieces that they've read um, uh, for the competition. Um, so uh, a, a quick recap of the prizes of the competition. Uh, the first prize um, uh, gets a cash prize of 150 uh, pounds and a scholarship of 1,000 pounds for the CCR Academy. In addition, all of the winners will get certificates and, um, and, and publication opportunities on the website. Um, so uh, second prize gets a 750 uh, pound scholarship and the third prize gets a uh, 500 pound scholarship. And um, just a quick word about uh, what the programs at the CCR Academy um, do. So um, all our uh, judges actually uh, also uh, work at, uh, uh, are, are partnered lecturers at the CCR Academy. And at the CCR Academy, we offer a range of research programs where high school students get to work with leading academics on research projects. And this is uh, kind of similar to what you guys have done for the competition, but sort of a little more intense and a little more um, in depth. These are pretty long programs and uh, pretty rigorous. So if you wanna learn a little bit more about that, um, you could also uh, email me later or just look, uh, look it up on the website. So I just wanna quickly walk through um, all the competition finalists and uh, announce their names and uh, the title of their essays. Um, so in the popular science category, uh, we picked uh, five finalists um, and uh, excuse me if I mispronounce your name. Uh, 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 for the third place of this category, we had Awahan uh, Sapkota from Nepal, uh, who wrote an essay entitled The Roles of Vaccines in Combating COVID-19. Um, Chegan Jong uh, from South Korea uh, was a finalist who wrote a paper entitled Responding to the Challenges of Distributing the Novel MRA Vaccines Against COVID-19. Shan Chua, who got first place, uh, wrote an essay titled Beyond Bats and Electric Sheep. Essay on Jung, second place, uh, wrote an essay on a crisis within crisis, what our children are facing. Aaron Ryu, uh, Ryu uh, from USA wrote an essay uh, titled Safety, Then Speed. Um, in the stories category, uh, the first place went to Lunetta Osterhaus, uh, who wrote an essay entitled Macondo. Uh, uh, second place went to Madeline Chung uh, with her essay Watercolor. Third place, uh, place went to Juna Hong, uh, who wrote an essay entitled, Like an Arc of a Storybook, This Too Has Come to Pass. Uh, Manya Goya, who wrote uh, One Day at a Time, and Aria Borelli, uh, uh, who wrote Stay Stupidly Taught and Reflect, were both finalists of the stories category. Um, in the social science and humanities category, uh, first place went to Kate Lowry, um, uh, who wrote an essay uh, entitled Justice in COVID-19 Crisis Triage, Race Equity and Maximization. Uh, second place went to Andrew Liu, uh, who wrote an essay entitled Impact Through in Innovation, the Role of Shun Peters Gale During the Pandemic. Uh, third place went to Vincent Tong, who wrote an essay entitled uh, The Rise of Digital Authoritarianism Under COVID-19. Uh, the remaining uh, finalists in this category uh, include Pat Harris, who wrote uh, How Popular Media Can Reduce Long, uh, Long COVID Suicides, Ashley Kim, who wrote The Significance of COVID-19 for the Future of Gender Inequality, and Paul Kim, who wrote COVID-19 and the Futility of Pro Progress. Um, I won't run through all the honorable mentions, but I wanted to uh, put them here um, just to um, sort of, as a reminder for myself, of just the number of great essays that were submitted this year. Um, it was really, really a difficult judging process. Um, uh, there were uh, internal disagreements and, um, so even if you didn't make the finalist shortlist or even if you made it and didn't quite get the third place prize, do know that um, a lot of you guys were, were extremely, extremely close and the decision process was very, very difficult. 
Okay, so that's all the introduction I will do. Um, and um, as promised, we'll move straight into student presentations. Um, a quick reminder of the structure of these presentations. Um, we will have roughly a maximum of 20 minutes per student uh, with a 10 minute uh, presentation followed by uh, comments from the judges uh, and a Q&A session. Um, these are sort of, the 10 minute mark is, uh, is a um, hard limit. I will actually be setting a timer. Um, but the five minute, five minute structure is pretty flexible. Um, so welcome our first presenter, uh, Sean Chua. Hi, Sean. Hello. How are you? Uh, I'm good, are, are you, how are you? Are you gonna, um, are you gonna do a, a presentation? Are you gonna share a screen or? Um... Uh, no, I'm just gonna read my uh, essay. Okay, excellent. Um, whenever you're ready, Sean. Okay, um, so good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean Shua from the Philippines, and today I'll be reading my essay on the use of AI in COVID-19 response uh, entitled Beyond Bats and Electric Sheep. Manila, March 2020. Philippines strongman President Rodrigo Duterte just declared a nationwide lockdown due to the rapid spread of COVID-19 across the country. The echo chamber on social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter would indicate this action as a decisive one. In reality, however, it's a little too slow, a little too late. In a month, COVID-19 had already spread to every single region in the Philippines and cases continued to soar. In just a little over a year, the spread has resulted in more than 1.5 million cases and more than 25,000 deaths. The Philippines has consistently been ranked to be in dire straits. Despite having the longest lockdown in Asia, not only has the Philippines suffered significant economic losses, but COVID-19 has also wreaked havoc to many sectors of the country with national health care at the brink of collapse from its core. As pervasive as COVID-19 is, it seems as if it cannot be stopped, merely slowed down. Yet, there's a beacon of light that's massively accelerating in crafting solutions to combat this angel of death. At no other time are artificial intelligence and data science being developed at such a rapid pace, resulting in breakthroughs in healthcare and medicine. AI and data science have been employed towards vaccine creation, drug discovery, disease spread monitoring and management, contact tracing, and mass, mass testing efforts, among others. In the Philippines, the Philippine Red Cross, or PRC, utilizes AI and data science in countless ways. In collaboration with Y Combinator startup, Dashlabs.ai, the PRC is able to monitor, provide, and predict real-time hospital information, including that of bed availability. At the onset of the pandemic, hospitals were quickly overwhelmed. Consequently, many were not able to find beds immediately, and some of those who waited ended up dying. To resolve this extremely concerning issue, a dashboard was developed providing essential real-time information, such as location, contact details, and regular and ICU bed capacity on hospitals in the country. Using data science and AI, the platform also provides capacity predictions based on historical data, so the PRC can know where to direct availability requests. While predicting hospital capacities and bed requests can largely be considered reactive, COVID-19 response must more importantly be proactive. Enter clinical epidemiologists by AI. To predict the spread of COVID-19 in the Philippines, researchers from the University of the Philippines, or UP, and Philippine General Hospital, or PGH, use different, use different epidemiological models for different cities within the national capital region. These models included a population density-based variation of the SIR model, an SEIR model, and another SIR model created by Darwin Bandoy and UP Los Baños. To aid in their calculations, the researchers used R0, or the basic reproduction number of an infection in the aforementioned models. By running simulations, the researchers involved were able to create suitable predictions of varying types. On their own COVID-19 dashboard, they present projections for optimistic, actual, and pessimistic figures of the number of new cases 
based on a seven-day moving average. Another facet of COVID-19 response were AI is that of data integrity. The Electronic Case Investigation Form, or ECIF system, developed by the PRC, allows arriving passengers who enter their personal and travel details in advance to easily go through the testing process. They're able to monitor their specimen, get their test result, and receive a clearance certificate. In the ECIF, a photo of an identification document is required. While some passenger information may be taken from the text fields, passport photos remain vital as they still serve as the most common and trusted source of information for passengers. To extract the necessary information, passports uploaded to the ECIF go through AI object detection and optical character recognition, or OCR. OCR converts images containing text into text objects. This process is done for millions of passports, significantly fast-tracking authenticated patient data processing. We were able to, to build a fast and easy way to link these with mandatory swab tests for passengers without any special equipment. With the increased data accuracy from an originally manual encoding process marred with errors, every passenger got their correct result in no time. Aside from data integrity, data science and AI can also be used for analysis of large data sets. The Philippine Red Cross used this to implement mass testing at rapid rates. As we know, there are a number of tests that can be used to detect the presence of COVID-19 in an individual. Nasopharyngeal swab, reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction tests, or RT-PCR, antigen tests, and many more. Using data science, the PRC determined that the results provided by the saliva RT-PCR tests are not significantly different compared to that of a nasopharyngeal swab test. Due to this proof, the country's Department of Health has authorized the use of cheaper saliva RT-PCR tests as a viable replacement for the more expensive RT-PCR swab test without sacrificing quality and accuracy. We've since seen an uptick of people getting tested as testing is now more economical. At the very center of testing is ensuring that COVID-19 test results are as accurate as possible. Machine learning works by feeding an input called training data processing them through some code, then the machine giving a decisive output to a certain degree of accuracy. Once again, the PRC and Dashlabs.ai collaborated to design and implement a machine learning model to quickly and accurately recommend test results to pathologists. Nerd hat on. The model consists of an artificial neural network with multiple layers. About 48,000 pre-labeled test results were used for training the model and 12,000 for testing. The model's first layer consisted of a 135 neuron dense layer with ReLU as its activation function. A sigmoid function was also used as a network's final layer, which ultimately provided a quantitative measurement of the presence or absence of the virus for a particular test. Got it? Got it. The model achieved an accuracy of 99.03% for samples from the test set, a remarkable feat for the developers and the entire country. There are even more efforts by the Philippines to adopt AI in COVID-19 response. The Department of Science and Technology, or DOST, developed the Cherish app, which uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to provide an unalternative diagnosis for the presence of COVID-19. In accordance with the DOST's thrust of AI for a better normal, this app analyzes chest x-rays to determine the possibility of a person contracting the virus via pneumonia. Foundationally, this app echoes one of the fundamental usages of machine learning, anomaly detection. In a nutshell, machine learning models can be trained to distinguish between images with varying characteristics. In this context, it would be images of healthy chest x-rays versus those showing pneumonia. In relation to the potential success of the Cherish app, DOSD Philippine Council for Health Research and Development Executive Director, Dr. Jaime C. Montoya, said that once fully developed, this technology will be able to assist medical professionals by offering an alternative, scalable, and efficient mechanism that would augment the current workflow of our hospitals and testing centers to screen for possible COVID-19 infections among suspected patients. This could pave the way for a totally different future of healthcare. Other countries heavily use machine learning as well to solve other COVID-related problems. Benevolent AI, a UK biotechnology company, does AI-assisted drug discovery. Benevolent AI uses their AWS-powered knowledge graph that incorporates the entire corpus of relevant publicly available data 
and is continuously enriched by in-house experimental results. Together with their models, they are then able to gain clearer insights of the nature of a disease essential in finding drugs in COVID-19 treatment. From the results, they found that baricitinib, a drug often used for treating rheumatoid arthritis, possesses antiviral properties that can, be, that can also be used in treating COVID-19. Since their discovery, baricitinib has been approved by the FDA for emergency use and proven to reduce mortality of hospitalized patients by 38%. Across the pond, researchers from Johns Hopkins University published the COVID-19 severity prediction model. Depending on certain information, such as race, age, BMI, and comorbidities, the model can successfully predict how much a patient's condition worsens after a certain time period. Consequently, this enables better preparation by all stakeholders. There is no doubt that data science and AI have played an invaluable role in COVID-19 response, both here in the Philippines and around the world. The recent rapid developments in data science and AI, however, were partly born out of necessity. Why don't we make these developments and their pace the norm? Despite their fairly nascent nature, data science and AI seem to be the keys to revolutionizing lives worldwide. The 1968 dystopian novel asks, do androids dream of electric sheep? We say, without the need to wait for dystopia, we need to quickly build AI that can dream beyond electric sheep. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Um, I'm gonna now uh, open up the floor to, um, to Tom and Daniel and Hande to uh, give some comments. Uh, Tom, I saw your hand, or yeah. Yeah, sure. Th thanks so much. I found this essay uh, really fascinating. So I think you offer a very positive picture of the power of AI, the power it has today to help us out and the power it might have in the future to help us out even more. Do you think there's a kind of downside to AI as well? Are there any risks of relying so much on AI? and risks involved with so much personal data being, uh, being available. What do you think? Um, I think on the analytical side, um, machine learning models um, tend to overfit when um, data uh, fit a certain characteristic or there's just too little data points. So um, there is a chance that too much reliance on AI could give uh, inaccurate results. But in the case of COVID-19, you know, there have been uh, millions of tests uh, developed. So I think um, with regards to accuracy, uh, AI would still be reliable. Um, when it comes to data, however, um, I'm, I don't know too much about um, how data security works in AI, but um, that would be up to governments and those managing um, large AI firms to make sure that uh, data provided by individuals remain confidential. Thanks. Uh, May I jump Monday, in? You want to go now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, please. Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Sean. This was very um, informative and exciting to read. I particularly like liked your language, use of language. I thought it was very accessible and informative at the same time and also figurative at times um, and very well explained. Something I was curious about is you've touched briefly on potential collaborations in AI. Um, so I was wondering what you thought about that, whether you think collaborations um, around AI across different countries would be something that could happen, um, or would that be something that would divide countries more so that each can actually um, have their own success in that regard? Um, I think when it comes to AI, um, political divide or any other human bias that we may have doesn't really affect it so much. Um, the only way that uh, it can potentially divide would be that would, would depend on the type of data that uh, is fed. So if data from one country uh, is incomplete or inaccurate, when that's fed to uh, an AI model, that could potentially be a source uh, for confusion, not only for um, that country specifically, but also for other countries or other governments who rely on certain AI models. 
Thank you. If I may, hi. Um, thank you so much for uh, your presentation and for, yeah, it has been a pleasure to read your essay. And you can really see that you're passionate about um, uh, AI and its applications. And uh, I, mm, uh, I have the same uh, idea as Tom's that you have a very positive uh, attitude towards it uh, and you stress a lot the um, advantages of it. Um, especially when in the end you propose or you advocate for a more extensive use um, and to make the use of AI and in general data science the norm. Is there anything specific that you're thinking about? Have you thought of anything specific? Maybe when it comes to, for example, um, transportation, I think um, although there, there may be some risk, you know, like how, how Tesla now has himself driving cars and there have been cases of some te technological like glitches in the system, but I think um, uh, AI, uh, in, ter in terms of risks, I think AI would still outweigh um, human drivers when it comes to, for example, uh, reaction time. Because for example, human drivers tend to uh, maybe and drive distractedly. Maybe let's say they're, they're not paying attention or they're texting or doing something else. I think that's what AI is there for. It's just to serve as a safety net um, for, for human drivers. And I think, um, you know, as the world is becoming more progressive, um, efficiency is key. So I think um, the intertwining uh, of AI and transportation could be a great avenue to explore in the future. Okay, um, in that case, let's um, give a, I guess, a big round of virtual applause for Sean. Uh, congratulations on um, uh, your, uh, on, on, on your essay. Um, and let's move on to the next presenter, uh, Seyon. Yeah, um, I actually have a presentation, so I'll quickly pull up my slides. Excellent. Could you um, tell me if my screen sharing is working? Yeah, it's working. Okay, thank you. So today I'll be briefly presenting about my essay. First, I'll um, talk about my topic and my motivation to write about this topic. Also, kind of a summary of my key findings or key takeaways from my essay, and finally, some closing thoughts. So, um, the topic of my essay was the effect of COVID-19 on children's psychology. Psychology is defined as the study of mind and behavior. So in other words, my essay was about how the pandemic affected children's mental health. When studying the change of children's psychology during the pandemic, I looked at two different aspects, the educational psychology and developmental psychology. Educational psychology involves the study of memory, conceptual processes, a cognitive ability and critical thinking, skills that is used during students' academic life. I mainly looked into school reports or news articles about how students were suffering severe academic stress during the pandemic era. The developmental psychology explains the growth of a children, which involves one social, emotional, and cognitive process. The main resources that I looked into were interviews or news articles in which students shared their experience of isolation and how they cope with emotional hardships such as anxiety. So after reading the description of the popular science section, I wondered what would be meaningful for the public to know about um, something that is related to COVID. I wanted to talk about something that did not receive much attention amidst of the chaotic year. So after reading through COVID related articles, I realized that news articles highlighted the effect of COVID-19 on education, such as reduced academic achievement and emotional hardships that students face. However, only a few of them went into depth about the enrooted psychology psychological consequences of the pandemic that might lead to extensive long-term effects. Realizing this gap in knowledge, I wanted to give a new insight into children's psychology from a more in-depth scientific perspective to show how students were immensely affected by the pandemic. So one of the um, structures that I used was the storytelling organization. And 
to convey my topic in an engaging way, I included short anecdotes from students that were presented in news interviews or articles. The storytelling organization portrayed the topic in an entertaining manner as readers were able to hear real stories from teenagers and how their experience, um, how their experience of the pandemic was like. Some of the key findings from the educational psychology perspective started all the way back since preschool students. During the pandemic, there was a drastic in de decrease in preschool enrollment rate as parents feared the virus or knew the limitation of online learning. This was a major change to acknowledge as preschool sets the stage for children's future education and lifelong development. For example, one of the key things students learn during this time is phonemic awareness, which is the ability to recognize spoken language. Considering the fast development of young children, one or two years of educational delay could lead to potential learning difficulties. I also um, extended the effect of educational psychology um, throughout high school students. So among uh, 75,000 high school students' responses collected through, collected from 2018 to 2020, 42% of the students reported a decreased engagement in learning, and nearly 56% said that their school-related stress increased since the pandemic. High levels of demotivation and poor online learning conditions naturally led to students' reduced academic performance, such as a drastic increase in failing grades. From the states, 42% of the students in Houston, Texas, failed more than one class during the 2020 academic year. Um, I, con I concluded this section by um, mentioning some of the long-term consequences of the pandemic. First, the increased stress and disengagement in classes leads to reduced academic performance and learning opportunities. This also leads to, um, this also restricts a student's opportunity to discover their potential to discover their potential or develop one's knowledge and some of the news articles and reports highlighted how this leads to difficulties in securing jobs in their near future and if they don't have a job it could also lead to economic um it could also affect their economic status which in turn affects um leads to like poor health um poor living conditions and even higher crime rates so from the development, um, developmental psychology perspective, one of the most interesting findings that I um, discovered was the different um, symptoms by age group of the children. So the National Child Traumatic Stress Network noted that the behavior and psychological impact of COVID-19 varies by children's developmental stage. Children in preschool mainly show sign of fear, reduced desire to eat, frequent complaints, and anxiety to be away from their families. In elementary school, students show higher levels of impatience, nightmares, and sleep deprivation. In adolescence, students suffer additional inactivity and isolation. So by looking at this overall trend, as children grow up, they tend to feel more insecure as their understanding of the experience of the pandemic are more direct than children like um, than children guided by their parents. The most common and severe psychological symptoms that children experienced in all age groups was anxiety. So after um, looking at the consequences of COVID-19 from an educational and developmental psychological perspective, I um, presented one psychological treatment called positive psychology as a potential solution. So positive psychology focuses on students' well-being, emotions, creativity, and strength instead of focusing on children's problems. The key to positive psychology is not trying to diminish the negative emotions, but augmenting positive ones. The implication of positive psychology to education is called positive education. One popular activity in positive education is the responsibility pie chart made by Bounce Back, the first positive education program. The responsibility pie chart get, guides students to realize the three factors of negative situations, their behavior, others' behavior, and luck. The, visual, the visualization of negative events help children to learn the controllable and uncontrollable, uncontrollable factors. Providing an optimistic and objective view of their lives depend, develops their confidence and responsibility. 
So after writing um, this essay, I thought that the, CC the CCIR essay competition gave me the opportunity to learn more about children's psychology and the effects of COVID-19. I was able to conduct some in-depth research about the field of my interest and realize the importance of understanding psychology as it relates to so many factors. As a student who also went through these difficult times of the pandemic, it was interesting to understand the underlying reasons for such anxious and isolated feelings that I felt over the past year. And I'm grateful for the opportunity I was given to present my study and findings through this popular science article. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seon. Um, okay. Uh, Let's uh, move into some uh, judges' comments. Tom, would you like to go first again? Sure, yeah, it's absolutely a brilliant piece of work and a, and a very nice presentation as well, I would say. Um, so one, one question I had, you mentioned about future job prospects, which is a really interesting topic. So I was wondering what difference it might make that so many people in your generation are in the same situation. So you might, somebody might optimistically think, there's not going to be a problem because everyone's going to be in the same boat, right? So everyone's had these difficulties, so nobody's going to be disadvantaged by having those difficulties. Do you think that makes it okay, or do you think there are still problems we need to worry about there? Um, so um, I think I also briefly mentioned this in my essay, but I also talked about how, like, the um, severity of the difficulties that were faced by students also vary by their demographic groups. So um, one thing I found was that female students um, tend to suffer more emotionally since um, compared to men. So and also like um, students living in like poor regions or who doesn't who didn't get like enough educational support during this era um, performed more badly compared to other students. So maybe like we still should be concerned about those demographic characteristics that like that kind of vary the um, effect of the difficulties. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, this seems to apply to a lot of things with the pandemic. It's mm -hmm. wrong to think it's affected everybody in the same way, right? It might have affected everybody. It looks like there are clear differences in how badly it's affected people and that can lead to inequalities later on and i think with health that's really obvious but it's very interesting to think about it in terms of education and mental health as well so i agree thank you uh, um yeah thank you um this was really engaging both the presentation and um and the piece so thank you so much i especially liked um the um, angle of peace. What I was wondering about is because a lot of the educational aspects that we're talking about during the pandemic have to do with homeschooling. So um, you just briefly had um, the role of the parents in, in the presentation, but I was wondering what you thought about the parent-child relationship within this whole um, equation. Do you have any insights about where it is or where it is going with the pandemic, what kind of impact it has on discussion of anxiety you had in your essay? Um, sure. So uh, one of the findings I like, one of the things that I also read about was how like due to the lockdowns, the time that children spent with their family um, increased compared to other years. And this also kind of augmented the effect of parents' emotion on children. So one interesting article kind of um, said that children were like little sponges, like they absorb all the information, all the emotions around their surroundings. And during the pandemic, I think the biggest um, effect for children were their parents. So maybe like if the parents are kind of stressed about their economic situation or stressed about or like anxious about the situation, I think that um, that was kind of directly conveyed to the children as children really easily sense their parents stress or when their parents are unhappy. And I think like the bond between the children and parents became stronger, but that also negatively impacted the children since they were also exposed to those negative emotions that the parents had some difficulties coping. 
Yeah, thank you so much. That all makes sense. And I think that's all part of this whole equation that we've been talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed uh, both the presentation and reading uh, the essay and particularly this, what I call the journalistic style of uh, storytelling to engage the reader immediately backed up with evidence and uh, data, which I really enjoyed. Um, I have one question. Um, so you briefly mentioned, and you already mentioned in your previous, one of your previous answer, um, the, um, uh, the fact that the, the pandemic hit different groups in different ways. And in particular, when it comes to um, education opportunities. Uh, have you thought of what could be some of the specific disadvantages that most disadvantaged in terms of socioeconomic, uh, uh, socioeconomic terms, students have experienced? For example, thinking of homeschooling, uh, remote learning, could you identify or have you thought of something specific, some specific issue for group, uh, students in these groups? Um, so I think one of the biggest issue was kind of the internet connection. So most of the, um, like all schools maybe experienced like lockdowns and they had to turn to remote learning. And, um, so like internet connection isn't something that like all families have. And I think this really limited, like it didn't just reduce the quality of online learning, but it actually just closed down the opportunity to actually attend the classes in some of their schools. So I think just like the online learning, like remote learning process itself kind of just shut down the learning or educational opportunities for many students. So I think that was the biggest problem and we weren't really prepared for the sudden lockdowns and the school didn't have any time to prepare or support their children. So yeah, I think that was the biggest problem. All right, thank you. And um, one thing from my head, uh, regarding the uh, missed interaction with other students, um, do you think that that was a problem, especially for students not coming from particularly educated family backgrounds? So the possibility to uh, have interaction with students from more advantaged backgrounds in school uh, do you think that this could could enter the equation somehow? I mean, I don't know. I'm asking you what your opinion about. Um, so one of the factors that were highlighted was the parents' educational level and how that affected um, children. So I didn't really research in depth like how this relationship works, but children coming from a more... Um, like children coming from a family with a higher education level tend to perform better. And maybe I think that's because they know the importance of academics or their parents really stress the importance of doing like performing well academically. Um, another guess is that, um, so like parents who have lower education levels might still like spend most of their days going out to work and like they couldn't support or kind of guide um, their children through these difficult times. And maybe that could have also affected. Thank you, that's all very Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, excellent. Um, and uh, are there any student questions? Um... Oh, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, so then, do you have any suggestion on general on how to reduce or ameliorate the psychological or educational difficulties that students are currently facing? Um, so one solution was positive education that I mentioned earlier. Um, I think, so personally what I think was, was that like, the main reason why children face these emotional like crisis was because they don't really um, talk much about their difficulties. Like we kind of tend to not talk about like what we are our inner conflicts and maybe just opening up and admitting our difficulties and kind of talking to school counselors or 
parents, teachers, friends, maybe just like being honest about our emotions could kind of just reduce those um, psychological effects of the pandemic. Um, Andrew. Yeah, that was a great presentation. So I had a question. So uh, in Canada, some of our elementary schools haven't really closed. Uh, they stayed open and a lot of the daycares also stayed open. And I know you explained a lot about the long-term negative effects of you know, the lack of interaction because these schools closed. I was just wondering your uh, about your opinion. Like, do you think the trade-off is worth it? The fact that we do keep some students in like the schools, like, um, for their ed education. Do you think that's worth the, some of the long-term risks? Uh, sorry, so if it, it, it's worth the risk of like um, expo potentially exposing them to uh, COVID-19. Um, so a lot, um, from, I would answer that um, it's, it was kind of a risky decision because although they were kind of like they didn't have to cope with like the online learning and the like lack of interaction um, in online platforms, they would be exposed to other risks such as like the fear of the virus. Like, and if they were kind of, if their schools were open during the pandemic, I um, guess that they were really, they had really like strict regulations to keep their masks on, um, maintain social distancing, and that could like those kind of strict and um, like tense atmosphere of the schools could have still stressed the students. And I think those would have led to equal psychological consequences. So yeah, I think like both has different um, long-term consequences in the psychological perspective. So yes. I have a question if that's all right. Yeah, please jump in. Um, do you have any thoughts on the like impact on society from the psychological implications occurred because of COVID nineteen on children? Like, will our society drastically change not just because of COVID, but because of the psychological impact on children? So, um, I'm not sure about like drastic. Um, consequences but maybe like because this like we are also like the future generation that would um, in the near future kind of lead the society like lead the economics maybe um, like the reduced um, academic performance or the number of students that had to that were limited from such like school education could affect um, maybe our economics or like some of the um, learning outcomes in future education. So yeah, that's what I have in the top of my head right now. Cool. Um, so I don't think we have time for any more questions, um, but clearly say on your presentation and, and inspired quite a lot of curiosity um, uh, and quite a lot of difficult questions too, actually. Um, but. Once again, uh, thank you so much, Seyoung. Um, another big round of virtual applause. Um, uh, we'll take a short five minute break um, and reconvene here um, at uh, 57. Um, and uh, in the meantime, get a drink of water, go to the bathroom. And when we come back, we will have um, uh, Kate Lowry uh, present uh, her, her piece on um, justice in COVID-19 crisis triage. Okay, see you guys in a moment. Um, Kate, would you like to um, uh, share your screen? All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Lowry, and the title of my um, essay was Justice in COVID-19 Crisis Triage, Race Equity and Maximization. <clears throat> so for my essay, I decided to write a bioethics paper with a focus on the value of justice in the COVID-19 hospital triage. And if you can remember in the beginning of the pandemic, hospitals around the world um, had faced extreme ICU overflow and they had to decide as to who they should allot priority to. And I wanted to write an analysis of the ethicality of the decisions being made. 
So I chose to focus a lot on the concern for race equity and how members of certain populations were disadvantaged in many ways. So I just wanted to read the beginning of my essay to give you a little bit of an introduction as to what um, I'm gonna be talking about. So the COVID-19 pandemic has forced hospitals into a crisis standard of care that has required the allocation of limited resources and forced clinicians to make the difficult decisions about who gets the ventilator, dialysis machine, or ICU bed. The crisis standard of care trias scoring guidelines in place today follow the utilitarian framework of maximization, which allocates scarce resources to those deemed most likely to survive long-term in order to save the maximum number of lives. At times, this goal can supersede the principle of justice by placing those in, uh, sorry, by placing those um, in um, racial minorities, specifically black and Hispanic populations um, in the lowest priority. So those racial minorities, specifically black and Hispanic populations have been disproportionately harmed by utilitarian triage guidelines that seem neutral on paper, but this neutrality comes with negative consequences. As a result of systemic inequalities regarding access to care, jobs, adequate education and housing, these populations are fundamentally disadvantaged in scoring systems because of their comorbidities, which result in reduced expectations for long-term survival. And if saving the maximum number of lives perpetuates health inequities for people of color, is it possible to maintain a utilitarian goal while simultaneously valuing justice and mitigating inequalities for these populations? When considering both the value of human life and acknowledging existing barriers to health, the decision as to who gets the needed resource introduces many sides to the complex ethical dilemma of medical triage. So just like in my paper, I wanted to give a little bit of a background on the crisis standards of care. So I talked about the, um, the continuum that hospitals follows, which begins at a conventional standard um, and increases in intensity to a contingency standard, um, which is more of a preparation stage for the eventual crisis standard. And in this um, state, a hospital's goal is to save the most number of lives, um, which is also known as a maximization. But another important aspect of this dilemma was the SOFA score, also known as the sequential organ failure assessment. And to be put simply, it prioritized patients with the least amount of organ dysfunction to put those um, in the greatest risk for death um, at the lowest priority. But most of my paper discussed um, the disparities in prioritization. So due to systemic injustices that um, in particular black and Hispanic populations face in their lifetime, um, they're far more likely to develop comorbidities, um, which is one of the main contributors to disparities um, in this prioritization. So some of the um, examples of these comorbidities are chronic kidney disease, diabetes, um, and more. But the combination of one of these conditions plus a COVID-19 diagnosis accounted for a significant um, amount of deaths across the world. Um, and in the US um, in particular, um, chronic kidney disease, um, black patients were four times as likely to develop it um, as um, white patients and Hispanic patients um, were about two times as likely to develop it um, as their fellow white patients. But one of the points that I was making, um, I was questioning if the SOFA score and um, similar scoring assessments are fair, um, considering the disparities um, in comorbidities of patients um, uh, between different races. So to analyze um, this kind of dilemma, I decided to look at it first from a utilitarian um, perspective. Um, and in this utilitarian centered triage approach, it was all about saving um, the greatest number of lives. And to achieve this goal, it would mean that hospitals would have to prioritize those with a greater chance of surviving um, beyond their COVID-19 diagnosis with that scarce resource. 
So as I did in my essay, um, I will share a simplified example of this. So if you have two patients, um, both in need of a ventilator, and one has, um, let's just say, a 90% chance of survival with the resource, and the other with a 10% chance of survival, um, determined using some type of scoring assessment, then um, under this um, approach, you would give the ventilator to the patient with a higher chance of survival. But one of the objections I had to this approach was that it did not um, account for systemic injustices um, and failed to consider how likely a patient was to develop their score raising comorbidities or if they already had a shortened prognosis for long term survival. So the next approach that I considered was a justice based approach. Um, and this focused more on equity, taking into account social determinants of health and giving more proportional care to those who are already disadvantaged going into the pandemic. So if two patients come in and one is at <clears throat> a higher disadvantage due to a variety of factors, including their race, the area that they live or work, and how they may have developed those health conditions, um, then they would ultimately be prioritized. And I argued that it is vital to take these factors in account because it wasn't exactly at the forefront of what a lot of healthcare providers um, were thinking of during this crisis standard. Um, I think it's important to take those into account, but um, it's not exactly realistic and to say that hospitals can take this much into account um, when they are so pressed for time in the ICU. It takes a significantly longer amount of time to consider these um, factors. So in conclusion, I um, argued that um, even though some may argue when a crisis standard of care situation, um, that it's not the time to focus on equity in the, in the healthcare system. Um, I believe that the pandemic has heightened racial inequities um, in certain communities in particular. And in my opinion, it has made it clear that there is no best time to make efforts towards reducing the strain of inequities in healthcare. And with pros and cons to um, both the utilitarian approach and the justice-centered approach that I discussed, um, both aspects need to be adopted into the already existing guidelines that have been set. And some of the suggestions that I had for a more ethical triage were to add some correction factors to the SOFA score, um, taking into account those comorbidities that put certain populations at a significant disadvantage, and also taking into account the area in which um, patients may live and things like the poverty level, um, environmental factors, and access to education that they may face. Um, that is all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kate. Um, that was a super interesting presentation, and I'm sure um, the judges have a lot to say about it. Um, Tom, would you like to go first? Sure, yeah, Th thanks. Another, another absolutely fascinating presentation. So um, I want to ask um, a, a kind of devil's advocate question, which is, why does equality matter? So if you, someone was a really hardline utilitarian, they'd say, look, all that really matters in ethics is trying to bring about as much good as possible. And the original system you described is doing that. And it would be a bad thing on that kind of outlook to get distracted by worries about equality and so on, because those things would stop us from maximizing good. Do you think you could argue against somebody who said that? Um, yeah, actually, um, you bring up some good points there. I think that's um, a lot of um, what we think about when we think of a crisis standard is to, to try to save um, as many lives as possible. But um, it really brings up the issue of um, who has the advantage already um, and who um, might not um, be in the same status to receive um, that kind of health, um, that kind of um, resource in that situation. So um, like I was describing before, um, certain individuals are more likely to have comorbidities that may um, give them a, a disadvantage that they may not 
um, survive um, or live a longer life to begin with. So why would you prioritize them if it's going to um, um, limit the amount of lives possible that you can save? But um, changing um, what it means to be equitable in the healthcare system is something that we need to think about all the time, not just um, in times where um, we're not in a crisis. And I think that it's really important to make those changes even now, um, even as we're facing a lot of, of, of um, pandemics of our own. Thanks, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. This was very um, interesting to read and um, very well explained. Um, this is something that you touched upon, but I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on that. Um, what do you think about the relationship between neutrality or objectivity and the institution of medicine? So you sort of showed that it's um, the idea of um, inequality or equality, equity, the, some of the concepts you've touched upon. Um, challenge that, but I would like to know if you think that's only just the experience at the medical institutions or do you believe that the institution of medicine is inherently not able to have an objective stance? So what are some of your thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> well, I think it's definitely um, something that's um, been ingrained into not just our society, but our healthcare system. Um, um, systemic injustices are, are very much real um, in the healthcare system. And I think that um, when we use certain scoring systems that um, kind of, we think eliminate all types of, um, um, you know, ways to um, single people out, um, single um, individual races out, it actually hurts them even more, not considering um, their race and um, their situation in life. Um, and I think that we kind of need to take a step back and assess that um, more clearly. Um, and I think that's something that um, we can always get better at. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to agree with that. And I think we could also look at how we arrive at those scoring systems. So who is being looked at? And there are always populations that are being disregarded uh, while that's happening. So thank you. Yeah, and um, I think, Hande, your question um, feeds almost straight into um, some of, uh, well, uh, the stuff, the kind of work that Danielle does with complex systems and, and that, that, um, dynamic systems theory. But um, I don't know, that might be a little off topic. But uh, Danielle, do you have any thoughts on the, the paper? Oh, well, first of all, um, I really enjoyed reading it. Um, also because I think uh, the entire discussion about uh, the ethics of the choice made, I think has been a little bit overlooked. Uh, was not there was not a discussion about it uh, and this is a problem per se uh, so that's one of the reasons for, we, for which I really appreciate it. Um, one question so uh, don't you think that just by maximizing the numbers of lives uh, saved uh, could be a little bit myopic um, especially if we think in an intertemporal perspective so yes maybe say today we are saving much more lives, but what about in 10 years from now? How does this uh, perpetuating and exacerbating inequalities and health inequality may have an effect on uh, the society in the future? Uh, definitely, I think that, um, <clears throat> sorry, what healthcare providers were kind of thinking during this, um, this time was to um, live in a crisis mindset and only save um, as many um, people as they could at this given time, but um, the pandemic did um, continue for a very long time and still continuing. And I think that um, it's not something that um, people can, um, I guess, change their perspective on or change those guidelines um, as quickly as they may have um, thought. And I think that when they are initially put in um, some of these guidelines just to be um, kind of a maximization, it kind of um, set us back in a way that it's it's very hard to change them. It's very hard to um, um, look at it from more of a justice-based um, lens when it's already being um, used on an everyday basis. So I think that we kind of need to go back and adjust what had already been um, put in place and um, 
to help those um, communities um, who were struggling. And I think that we didn't really see that kind of outcome until a little bit after. And I think that it's important um, to keep on changing those, those guidelines. Thank you. Cool. Um, so I'll open up the floor once again to uh, any, um, any students who may have some comments on Kate's paper. Uh, Andrew. Uh, yeah, so you presented lots of good perspectives. I think that you said like the medical care and the, medic, the medical system can sort of adapt. I feel like in, re, like, in, in our society, if we have a medical system, like maybe some uh, physicians are like, do discriminate against their patients or they have a system that inherently discriminates against certain groups. It's a little hard to just say, you know, adopt this new mindset and just help the people like without like having like actual maybe like rules and things. So I was just wondering, are there any, you know, practical app, like implementations that can actually shift the, uh, uh, a change within the system? Uh, yeah. So what I was kind of bringing up um, at the end of my paper were just some small suggestions that I think that um, we can all make. And a lot of those had to do with, um, uh, changes to the scoring systems that we have in place and just taking more into account in those scoring systems. So taking into account um, where people live, um, if they are um, more um, exposed or um, if they are in, um, in poverty, in, um, in, environmental, in an environment where they um, um, are not I guess as safe or do not have as much access to resources. And I think that um, things, just thinking about um, more about our patients and not just um, the score that's being put up, I think that um, would help. Thank you for your question, Andrew. And uh, anyone else? All right, um, in that case, uh, Again, Kate, these were some incredibly difficult questions. Hande, Hande's question, I thought, was especially hard. Um, <laughs> I, 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 yeah. Um, uh, but uh, thank you so much for your essay. It was really thought-provoking for me as well. Um, I, I, I agree with all the things that that the judges had said. Danielle mentioned how you touched on this subject that you know, weirdly, no one was really, uh, at least to to my knowledge, talking about that um, but seemed incredibly important. And once you pointed it out, always almost like a little obvious, but only in retrospect. Um, but uh, another wonderful paper, uh, a quick uh, virtual round of applause. Thank you, Kate. Um, so um, next up we have um, Andrew Liu. Um, uh, yeah, so I don't have slides. I'm just going to discuss um, about my paper uh, and talk about really the thought process that went through writing the paper, um, the ideas that I try to convey uh, behind the paper. So um, just going to briefly talk through it. Uh, the topic around my paper was on creative destruction. And I guess for those who aren't, aren't as familiar, creative destruction is this idea in economics that was coined by this Austri uh, Austrian economist, Joseph Schumpeter, who said that Within our economies, there is this everlasting cycle where you know, there are new innovations within the economy, new ways of doing things, new products, and new processes, right? But all of these, no, these new innovations come at the expense of the old ways of doing things, the old products and the old processes. So he claims that there really can't be progress without some sort of destruction of the past ways of doing things, of you know, making the, those ways um, not popular anymore. And I think that's definitely one of like a really interesting idea because it seems very paradoxical, right? The fact that we can't really progress further without sort of looking at the past and kind of just not using the, the products and the processes that we had in the past. And I guess um, a big exa example to illustrate this point, um, I live in Vancouver and I think up until a few years ago, like we didn't have Uber or Lyft. And the reason behind that was because the taxi association here kind of boycotted the arrival of Uber and Lyft because they understood that 
the arrival of Uber and Lyft meant that it was going to harm the taxi industry, right? There was going to be more competition and they knew that Uber was going, going to get more popular and popular and eventually it would lead to the destruction of the taxi industry. So I think there are lots of prominent examples uh, in society today of you know, creative destruction having practical applications. But I think in my paper, I really wanted to, I attempted to explore you know, some of the applications within the pandemic world. So the main idea was that you know, th there are examples of creative destruction happening within uh, the COVID-19 society. And there are two main like, types of creative destruction that I try to characterize within the essay. First being the, the examples the, of creative destruction that happened during the pandemic. And second of the pandemic sort of, the, the word, the term I used in my essay was accelerating the, the process of creative destruction. So in the first, first example, I think there are more obscure these are more obscure examples, more, I guess, less well known, because to be honest, like 90% of creative destruction happening in the pandemic were because they, they occurred, they started before the pandemic and they happened, they kind of, they were accelerated during the pandemic. So things such as in, in the first category, I, I know that Sean brought up like AI chatbots. So these are new inventions that are sort of here to replace, you know, the conventional in-person like receptionist coordinators and ways of, you know, moving the medical field forward. So they had this new invention that, you know, made it more efficient and it kind of will fill the, a gap in, in the industry. So these are some of the new inventions, but I also know I read a few papers, it's kind of hard to find papers when the pandemic is still going on, but I know there was a paper on virtual tourism. So I know lots of countries rely on tourism as, you know, a, a source of uh, income for a lot of the families in those areas. So an alternative that they made was using uh, online platforms to try to cater to the same audience. So they brought, you know, they used uh, 3D technolo technology or they used VR technology to try to bring tourism uh, to the same audience to make sure that, you know, they're still able to make a living. So these are some of the more, I guess, nuanced examples of creative destruction in a way that, you know, it's there to fill a gap. It's there to replace something that was there before. But I think 90% of the cases um, were under the other category that I tried uh, to explain, which is the fact that the pandemic really only accelerated the rate at which creative destruction happened. Because you know, a lot of the inventions that we had were started before the pandemic. So the big example that I tried to talk about was Amazon or Alibaba. So these are online retail stores that started before the pandemic, but because of the pandemic, they only got, they became more popular, right? Because everyone was in, stuck in their homes. They couldn't go outside. All the malls and shops were closed. So the only other alternative was to shop online. And that's why a lot of these big stores um, uh, grew bigger and they exploded, right? So I would say that they, they weren't invented. They weren't created during the pandemic, um, but the, the pandemic only made that process faster. They only made it faster for, you know, in in-store, you know, like the retail industry to fall faster. It only made the online retail industry grow faster. So under the second uh, example, I tried to characterize a lot of, you know, those cases. Another big example, I would say um, Uber Eats or DoorDash. So we know that a lot of the in-person dining services are, you know, obsolete now because they've shut down. But at the same time, restaurants need to make money. They still, people still need to make a living. So the other alternative is you have these services, they provide these new services. Well, they were still exist, they still existed before the pandemic, but they only grew bigger because of the pandemic. And these services, you know, got really big and they helped our economy. So that was really what I wanted to characterize, the fact that there are different examples of creative destruction within our society and they're applied different ways because of the pandemic. And I think the last thing I want to say is that just because there's, you know, the fall of many industries, you know, a lot of industries aren't doing well, people are losing their jobs. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. So a lot of the papers talk about how creative destruction is, in, is intrinsic to different economies that are healthy, right? It is, it, it's an innate part of our society and of our economy. So I just wanna say that even though there is a lot of bad things that are happening today, 
what it means is that it's kind of pushing us forward to you know rely on these technologies more it's pushing us basically in a direction that's more advanced for our society thank you so much andrew um so let's again begin with tom's comments I found this some really thought provoking. So in, in the UK, I particularly noticed this trend that there's been a lot of big high street shops that were already in trouble. And then the pandemic has just accelerated their demise, right? So it's not quite true to say that they closed because of the pandemic. They were going to close anyway, and it's just accelerated it. But I, I think I think the points you raise um, provoke quite a lot of ethical questions. So on the one hand, we've got the fact that all the people who work for these companies have lost their jobs and so on. That's a bad thing. On the other hand, we have this kind of accelerated progress that you talk about, and that's a good thing. From the way you argue, it seems like you say the good thing is bigger than the bad thing, right? That overall, it's for the best. So I'm wondering if you could say more to justify that, because, you know, for all the people who've lost their jobs, it doesn't seem that way. So, um, yeah. OK, so I think I would probably characterize it a little differently, where the alternative is more damage. So I think what we're actually looking at is the difference between a lot of damage and like less damage, because I think creative destruction, the way you should characterize it is, it's kind of, I think, offsetting some of the economic damage that's being done. So without you know the new innovative ways that people are trying to make a living, there would be more people that are, don't have jobs. There will be more people that you know, can't make a living and can't survive. So I think, the, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, it, it's a really good situation. You know, a lot of people are dying and a lot of people are losing their jobs. But I think it's just that creative destruction is a mechanism for, you know, some progress being made in the time where a lot of things are like really bad. Thanks. Uh, Hande? Yeah, thank you so much. This, I'm gonna echo Tom, I, I, th I thought it was very thought provoking as well. What I was thinking about is um, what kind of relationship you think there is with the economic changes you're outlining and political ideology. So do you think there's um, any impact of potentially changing political ideologies on the economic developments you're suggesting or the other way around? Um, so what, what kind of links are you seeing there? So in terms of, uh, so I, I, just so the the link between the the fact that there are new there's this destruction that's happening and uh, political I wouldn't say it's it, it caters to a specific ideology I would say that if like if you know that there are new developments and it's I, I guess it really depends on you know the p political scene in the places around the, around the world if there if politicians or specific groups are able to maybe you know capitalize on the fact that there are these new developments then i think that's something that's something that would be really strong in in, in time like this because you know a lot, there isn't much that can be done you know in uh these times there isn't really one right decision but i think if like no matter what political ideology, if you're able to capitalize on the fact that there are, you can still have innovation in this time, you're still able to make progress in this time. I think that's the real link between that. I, I wouldn't say there is really a link between a specific ideology. Okay, thank you. And uh, Daniel? Uh, thank you for the um, interesting presentation and um, um, I found it interesting and optimistic in one sense. And I'll tell you why, because um, surely, uh, especially the literature of the 90s, so you have uh, seen, uh, you also mentioned and read uh, Agion and Owitz paper, uh, took this very optimistic view on and the idea of uh, creative destruction. But if you go to uh, Schumpeter himself, uh, and even before him, uh, probably the first economist to introduce this idea, even without naming that way, was Marx. Uh, the idea of um, this process of creative destruction was thought uh, as unsustainable. And actually Marx thought that it would eventually lead to the uh, uh, 
collapse of capitalism, which did not happen for the bad or for the worse, uh, or for the good, I don't know. Um, how can you reconcile? Um, so can you take also a pessimistic view uh, of creative destruction? Uh, can you think that it can be unsustainable in the long term? Well, I, I would say that the, the, the values that it breeds isn't as like, they're, they're not that positive. So the fact that the, if people know that, you know, the next innovation is able to topple over like billion dollar companies and that we can have more competition. I know that competition is, is healthy, right? In the capitalist economy, how it, it breeds, it, it, it breeds better services, better products, you know, for the consumers. But I think if we, if everyone has this mindset that their next invention is going to, you know, you know, make them a lot of money or their next invention is going to, you know, replace this other industry. I don't necessarily think that's the best mindset to have in, uh, in the 21st century. I think we should be collaborating on what we have so far. It shouldn't just be focused mostly on monetary gains, but I think back to the pandemic, it's, it's okay. And it, at this point, I think like we have different, um, we, we need to be focusing on different things. So I guess right now, it, it's, it's okay in the short term, but definitely like in the long term, like if we continue, continue this mindset, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be the, the best thing. Thank you. Uh, and, and thoughts from uh, other students? I have something if that's all right. Yeah, so absolutely. In your example, um, you mentioned uh, a lot of already large corporations that seem to be benefiting the, from this, like Amazon and uh, Uber Eats, things that are already able to transfer to a large online platform. But what about like smaller businesses, ones that can't afford to go to an online thing or something that COVID is forcing them to transfer to? How do you think that this would affect them? Do you think it would further kind of accentuate a wealth gap or anything? I think that that's sort of basic, like the how the economy works, right? Like large businesses do have more money to develop, like their technology. They they're able to adapt better. They're able to survive better in this environment. So I think definitely they're able to survive better. But um, in terms of like the uh, examples, so there's like in like Amazon, and Uber Eats, they they do support local. Uh, companies and like, like, for example, Uber Eats, it supports local restaurants. Amazon, it's like you're selling uh, like products from, you know, maybe, maybe from small businesses, maybe from, you know, large corporations. So I think in terms of those examples, it's sort of, you know, it's kind of helping everyone, but I definitely like in the long term, if you're talking about creative destruction in general, I think large corporations do have an advantage. It does make it so that they're able to you know, innovate better, they're able to adapt better. So I, I do agree. I, I do think that's what's happening. Uh, Sam? Um, I also had a question about, like, you mentioned how people are, like, losing jobs because of this creative destruction. And, like, were there any solutions that you read or that you could think of to kind of, um, like, deal with those difficulties? I think some of the papers mostly talk about, they didn't really characterize it as losing jobs. They characterize it as job reallocation where people are losing jobs, but then other jobs are being created even more. So I think this, the solution is kind of inherent to the cycle itself. If we're not saying that, you know, overall people are losing jobs. It's kind of like losing jobs, but then you're also creating new opportunities and new jobs. So I think, Overall, like this is kind of a trend in uh, in general. Like there are jobs being replaced by you know technology, or there are jobs that you know there are more and more jobs that require you to have like a lot, to be competent for the job to have education. So I think the general trend is just that it's kind of bleak, but it's becoming more and more competitive. And I think that you know you need to be more like there, in one sense there are going to be new job opportunities but at the same time you need to be more qualified you need to be, be more educated and i think that's how you survive in that competitive environment 
Yeah, so Andrew, I just wanted to say um, that the, the way I understood your paper was um, sort of uh, Danielle and, and uh, was touching on sort of the optimism that or um, that that you were expressing. And um, when I read it, it was very much contextualized by a lot of the news that we get, which is about the unemployment and about sort of just this one side of things. So by sort of setting it against that background, it was that was what sort of struck me, especially by your about your essay, sort of injecting a little bit of optimism into uh, this background debate of unemployment and um, and, and economic downturn. Um, so I, again, I thought it was a, a really insightful and interesting piece. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Andrew. Uh, a big round of virtual applause. Um, uh, okay, uh, so we have one last presenter um, and uh, it's uh, Lunetta and she will be presenting her piece, um, uh, Macondo. So, yep, mine is titled Macondo and I'm just gonna read it if that's okay. So, yep, here we go. Long ago, I stopped viewing my life as a singular one. Instead, I saw it as multiple because with the big events and my responses to them, constituting both a beginning and an end, every moment of my existence could fall easily into a certain category, a life. But for me, the pandemic became more than just that. It became a world and it did so because of my mom, because my life was not mine to live, but it was hers. It was her fear and it was her sickness. My mom, always paranoid about something, grew fearful long before most Americans stopped viewing the coronavirus as that virus in China. She told my dad and I we should stop going out to eat, limit contact with people, wash our hands frequently, and practice general safe habits. All good tips, of course, ones that the experts not only concurred with, but suggested in the first place. But despite our best efforts, by March, my family ended up an unfortunate victim of the first wave. I spent the day in bed with a fever like I've never had, and a headache that made me want to stab an ice pick through my temple. The nausea was terrible and urged to vomit with no results, but all the symptoms, mom was sure, with all the symptoms, mom was sure it was COVID. But when she called the clinic, the nurse said that was unlikely. There just weren't that many cases in Minnesota yet. By March 11th, only five cases had been confirmed. The next day, she was sick too. And when we both got better a few days later, I stayed recovered. My sickness was a three-day episode. My mom was that, a break in months of misery. She says she pushed herself too hard, and I believe her. You see, we've been landscaping the yard for years now, but mom decided that a pandemic was the perfect opportunity to really make change. So rather than rest like any sane person, mom decided she wanted to take advantage of her time off work before it was gone, before the pandemic ended and took her free time with it. So with her insistence, the two of us set about doing the landscaping. My dad grudgingly helped too. He had wanted to do something fun with his time off. Maybe we should have listened. Because about halfway through, she sat down. Mom said she was having a hard time breathing and that her chest and back ached. The excitement she had started out with was gone, but a few minutes later, despite that, she was back to moving the heavy logs from a fallen tree. She was always the type to go a little too far. The next day, she was back in bed. I'd never seen her so sick before. Her symptoms are similar to all those that occurred the day before, but much, much worse this time. All of us, including her, were worried. For, days of, for after days of bed rest, she just wasn't getting better. She lay in that bed for months, crying and dying. It was only when her weeping became more extreme, when she stopped trying to hide it from me, that I knew. Mom was crying not because she felt awful, but because she thought she wouldn't get better. Silently, I began to agree too. My parents say those months between March and July, the months when she was the most sick, were the worst days of her, our lives. But for me, the worst came later. It came when I realized my life was hers. A time when my world, a world called Macondo, revolved around her, and when any choice I once could have made freely was now hers to make. Until then, those months really were awful. Claiming it was better for her outside, mom would hobble out onto the patio, practically a corpse. If I asked how she was, she would always assure me she was fine, but it was painfully clear she was not. But whenever she spoke fine, I could see the tears forming from her lies. Eventually, I stopped asking. It became, eventually, and it became a daily occurrence, when we were out in the yard and my dad was working upstairs outside of earshot, mom would pull me close. She said dad couldn't bear to hear what she had to say. He was too immature, but it was important and I had to know. Mom said she was certain she wasn't going to be around and she told me she was very sorry. Sometimes she cried, sometimes she didn't. Regardless, she would tell me how to live life without her. She said my dad couldn't take care of me. He would have a breakdown. So it'd be up to me to finish high school and finance my living expenses and later college. She mentioned some things I had to do 
including some financial statements and general advice. I listened, never truly believing her, but agreeing all the same. Those were before the days that she told me the only reason I kept on living was for you. We tried to find her care, but they didn't have COVID tests then, so she never got diagnosed. We all knew she had it though. Her symptoms were identical to everyone else who did. And even if she had, the doctors couldn't have known anything about the mysterious virus. There just weren't enough hospital beds, enough staff on hand, or enough information. We were all in limbo, and we couldn't understand why my mom was sick for so long. It was only when long haul COVID was declared a legitimate thing that anyone could really do anything. But even then, it didn't help much. She was sick. For over a year, she's been sick, gradually getting better, but never good. Not like she was, at least. Still, I insisted mom tell me the answers no one knew. When could I see my friends? When could I go back to school? How much longer till normal? I knew I stressed her out with those questions, but I wanted answers. And somehow I thought, as my mother, she got to have them. Instead, the questions made her stressed. The questions made her worse. All the while, dad asked me the same things. It was only through the dread of those conversations that I realized just how awful the ones between mom and I must have been. So I tried to stop asking her those pointless questions, but I couldn't help myself. Just like my dad, I too wanted comfort. So really, those months were the worst because I felt alone. Those months were the worst because I thought mom was going to die. Those months were the worst because dad couldn't handle things. He didn't know what to do, and instead of acting like a father, he wanted me to be the pillar of strength for him, to essentially be the adult. He came to me saying how hard everything was for him, as if I didn't know, and how scared he was. Those months were the hardest because our communication just broke down. Dad wanted me to comfort him. I just wanted him to shut up. Neither of us knew what was going to happen next, but I thought of my future anyways. I believed that if my mom went, so would my dad. I was convinced of it. He couldn't live with the responsibility of life without her, and I didn't know if it would be suicide, a heart attack, or an aneurysm caused by stress, or maybe even an accident made by grief. But I figured no matter how much he'd want to, he just didn't have the strength to live for me. He wasn't like my mom. It took him about a year to find any strength resembling hers. It was about that time that I hoped mom would just die already. I was certain she would, so I thought it'd be good to end her suffering early. But more than anything, I was tired of waiting for that future. I was exhausted from seeing her dying and listening to her tell me she wanted me to be cremated. That winter, as my parents celebrated my mom's gradual recovery, I fell into the addiction of solitude and misery. I was happy for her, but part of me felt like it wasn't real. She'd had moments where she got better only to fall back into her horrid sickness. This, fortunately, was not one of those times. So I found both relief and despair in writing and literature, specifically 100 years of solitude, because everything was the same every single day. It seemed like time had stopped, and when it restarted, I was moving at a slightly different pace, isolated from everyone moving normally. We didn't go out, mom made sure of that. In fact, the only times we left our solitude were from mom's doctor's appointments to get my driver's permit, a trip to the orthodontist to get my wisdom tooth out, or twice when she went to the ER. The first time she went, I didn't know about it till later. The second time I woke to a text from dad, mom and I are at the ER. She hadn't wanted him to send it. She didn't want me to know. I didn't want to know either. Everything that was an essential went, including chances to see, well, anyone. So the addiction grew stronger. By spring, I had an immense urge to run away, to leave Macondo. But as you might know, you can't. Still, I'd say that over spring break, when I didn't have to worry about school, that I'd buy a Greyhound bus ticket and just go somewhere for a week or two. I never did. I told myself that if I left, mom would get so worried she'd die, so I couldn't do it. I felt like my life was in an old home about to foreclose, so that suddenly everything, including the furniture inside and the grass out front, became hers too. My choices was her, my anger was hers, even my dreams. I know she owned those I knew she owned those too. And I knew they were being thrown away. Because what is life without dreams? Nothing. That's what nothing. And if she owned my life, she had to own those too, or else she'd own nothing. I wanted to get away, but there was no ticket out. I begged her to let me go, to let me see a friend or visit a grandparent. But each time her face got serious, and dad would say, we're trying to protect you, Luna. This isn't just about your mom. It's about your safety, too. I'd say I knew that, to which anything's better than being dead. But my mom, once so sick, knew that wasn't true. I knew it, too. So I waited for a ticket, but summer came, and it, the ticket, didn't. I got to visit my grandparents, but there was no ticket then, either. And I realized that leaving was more than I thought. After all, this is Macondo, I'd say. And when I die, I'll have died with the name Colonel Aureliano Bandia. I know now I'm never getting out, not until this life ends and a new one begins. With just a little momentum, a little change, a new life comes easy. I'm just waiting for death's ticket. After all, this life is too tired to pull any trigger. This life's just waiting to succumb to its own addiction and humiliation. It's waiting to leave Macondo, so that maybe the next one won't be as bad. Thank you, Lunetta. Um, 
that was, um, yeah, um, an incredibly uh, beautiful and personal piece. And thank you so much for uh, being willing to, to share that with all of us. Um, so um, I'll first turn it over to the judges for their comments, Tom. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. I don't have any questions for you. I just wanted to say what a great piece of work I thought it was. I thought the way you wove the kind of fantastical elements into it was really good. I thought it was incredibly honest, incredibly insightful, and really beautifully written. So just just well done, and I hope you I hope you keep writing. Thank you. Uh, Handy. Yeah, I just, I really, really enjoyed reading it. It was really spectacular. I love the depth of characters, the complexity of emotions, um, just, you know, how layered it was, um, just just very well um, constructed. Um, what struck me a lot was um, the idea of time, which is, you know, pre present all throughout your piece. Um, so as if time is suspended in that container and how it is experienced. And you have a lot of references to Gabriel Garcia Marquez as well. So I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about how you've um, been influenced by his understanding of time um, in, you know, in relation to your piece and maybe your own experience as well. Oh, um, sure. I guess, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows that the pandemic is kind of, you know, weird. You don't really get to see anyone. It's kind of hard to keep track of days even even in the summer of course when there's like no school or anything and so in that account it really does seem like time is kind of frozen and so reading his work really kind of stuck out to me because at the time I felt the same way that I was in a world that wasn't really changing and his world of Makondo was exactly the same for the most part yeah thank you so much I think we lost all of the, oh, yeah. Apologize about that, I dropped off. Um, uh, didn't mean to interrupt, Danielle. Oh no, uh, actually, I also don't have a question. I just uh, really enjoyed reading it. And uh, I also enjoyed the um, explicit and implicit references to uh, Macondo, uh, Cien Años de Soledad, and um, very well done. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Um, before I turn it over to the students, I also just wanted to say uh, that I really loved the piece and um, it, uh, it reminded me, especially in the parts where um, uh, the, some of the really brutally honest parts of the piece um, reminded me quite a lot of um, Maggie Nelson. I don't know if you've uh, read any of her stuff, but she's a wonderful, wonderful writer. Um, I encourage anyone to read some Maggie Nelson. Um, but this ability to um, be truly honest and in certain cases say things that would be frown very much frowned upon um, is uh, incredibly courageous and difficult to do. So um, uh, yeah, um, a, a lovely piece of writing. Um, so does uh, any of the students have, um, uh, have any comments or questions for Lunetta? Uh, Andrew. So in terms of like writing it, uh, how would you, like for you personally, how would you like balance um, giving, you know, talking about being being vulnerable and also trying to like, progress the plot, making sure you have a good plot in your story and making sure you include all like the relevant details? That is a hard question. Um, I guess for me, I felt like it wouldn't really mean anything if I wasn't honest. I felt like this past year was really about being honest with myself and kind of self-reflection and um, understanding not only myself, but the world around me. And I thought that if I didn't convey that kind of idea in my work, that it wouldn't really mean anything personally 
to me. And so I just kind of focused on that and everything else just kind of worked its way out. I don't know. Cool. Um, well, thank you so much, Lynetta, um, for sharing that piece and um, uh, a quick round of applause. Um, <laughs> um, it's it's always a bit awkward to do these virtual rounds of applause on on Zoom, but um, uh, we make do. Um, the uh, so unfortunately the uh, the second place um, for the stories category, Madeline Chun was uh, unable to join us today. Um, uh, so we're just going to conclude now uh, with some final comments from the judges um, about sort of their experience reading these pieces and um, thoughts about, um, general thoughts about um, their takeaways from reading all these uh, wonderful, wonderful essays. Um, Tom, would you like to begin first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, so I just, I just think the standard was just so incredible with this. I mean, that's evident from the uh, papers we heard today, but also ones that we haven't heard today. You know, there were so many fantastic submissions. Um, so I'm just uh, blown away by what a high level of achievement you're all managing in different areas. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank Oliver, who's organised this competition uh, and done an incredible amount of work to uh, to get it done. And I, I think this this shows what a success it, it it's been. So thanks very much to Oliver. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Hande. Yeah, um, I I'm just gonna um, also. First, thank you, Oliver, for doing most of the hard work. We did much, much less than what you've done um, in the background. Um, also, just I want to congratulate everyone who submitted something, um, anything, because I also know that it takes a lot of courage to do that. Um, so they've, they've submitted a lot of great work and they've submitted. So those both count a lot. Um, and I want to thank the opportunity um to have been able to read and learn a lot from what has been submitted thank you Ahmed. uh daniel um thank you oliver so yes i also uh would like to thank you for organizing this and for doing a lot of work and i it has been a great occasion for me to learn and to enjoy uh, many different um essays and readings and just one comment i have for uh, those who came first or second or third or for everybody who participated, really. Um, I mean, it's very easy when we have to order numbers on a line, right? So we know that 10 is greater than 9, is greater than 8. Uh, I don't know which is your level of maths now, but try to order vectors. There's simply no way, like not just one way, to order ve vectors. And this is the closest we have to uh, judging essays or even worse, judging people, judging performance. It's multidimensional. Uh, so congratulations to everybody. You're all winners. Uh, yeah, I, and I do want to uh, echo what you said there, Daniel. Um, there were so many, so many uh, essays that I would have liked to um, give the chance for you guys to share. Um, there were so many wonderfully interesting submissions in the uh, popular science and uh, significance categories, um, essays that talked about things I had I, that I learned from that made me uh, reflect deeper on certain things. In the story categories, um, there were so many stories that were genuinely deeply moving and uh, beautifully, beautifully written, subtle reflections um, that um, would, in certain cases, give expression to things that I had felt during the pandemic year that I didn't have the words for. And I felt quite grateful to be able to read the experiences of so many different people uh, from all over the world, um, and especially so many um, uh, young high school students who are reflecting at such a deep level and uh, who are so attuned with their environments and with their experiences and emotions. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. And I hope that it was um, an equally rewarding experience for all of you. 
Um, so just in conclusion, I would like to say thank you everyone for, uh, for participating in this. Um, um, and um, uh, yeah, good luck with everything. Um, and uh, with that, I think uh, we'll just draw this uh, uh, 2021 Rethink Essay Competition uh, to a pretty successful conclusion. Uh, thank you, everyone.